Hey guys, Mike with Langmere Systems. In this video, I wanted to go over a prototyping project that we had in our shop. Uh, we needed some parts made quickly for the Crossfire XR. Uh, you can see that here. It's our largest CNC plasma table. Um, if you're familiar with our products, um, you can go check out our website and learn more about this machine. Um, but what I wanted to do in this video was um, show you a part that we needed made, um, that we needed made fairly quickly. And we thought it would be a good opportunity to show us making this part on our newest machine, the MR1 CNC gantry mill. So a little bit about the project. Um, as I zoom in here, you can see this is the uh, gantry upright and we have a driven ball nut system here. There's a stepper motor and it has an overdriven timing pulley that is driving the ball nut hub here. And as this stepper motor rotates, it rotates this ball nut. And as you can see, it allows this gantry to ride along the y-axis rails. Um, and the ball screw is right here. So this is a rotating nut design. Um, it allows us to you know, use a much longer ball screw here without having any issues with whipping and things of that nature. Um, and so far it's worked uh, very well for us. Um, you know, through conversations with our other engineers here, we we kind of wanted to look at, you know, can we get more rapid speed out of this machine? And so we started looking at the torque RPM curves of these stepper motors, and we wanted to say, hey, when this thing is at full rapids, you know, are we taking full advantage of peak torque? Um, and so what we had come up with was that a more ideal gearing to test would be instead of an 18 to 1 pulley here, um, to go to something like a uh, 24 to one, or 24 teeth to 10 teeth, so 2.4 to 1 instead of the original 1.8 to 1. So a little bit more overdriven. And um, it would have been nice if we could have just got the, uh, you know, the next size pulley up, the 24 tooth pulley, and bolted it up here and tested. But unfortunately, as you can see when I come down um, the side here, that we run into clearance issues. Um, oh, wrong angle. Um, right here where, you know, you can see that the belt and pulley are already getting very close to this upright. Um, and so if we were to run a larger pulley, we'd, we'd definitely run into problems with clearance. So we had the idea of, okay, if we put a larger pulley in here, um, if we just push this motor out further, in other words, make this, this Y-axis motor mount bracket longer, we could run the, the uh, larger pulley. So I went ahead and modeled that up just to kind of see what, what you know, that could look like here. Um, and so there's the larger pulley. Um, you can see I kept the existing uh, parts modeled in there to kind of show, but you can see here, it's, it's basically the same bracket. It's just longer by about a quarter of an inch. Um, and so if we go and look at that bracket here, this is what we're looking at. Um, it's pretty simple. It's an aluminum bracket, half inch thick. It's got four tapped holes for 1024 screws. Those are what um, mount the stepper motor uh, to this bracket. It has this bore here, which is a spigot fit um, for the stepper motor um, for alignment. And then here we've got um, two quarter 20 tapped holes and that uh, bolts the motor mount into the upright here. So pretty simple part. Um, and what I want to do is, you know, instead of waiting potentially one to two weeks to have these parts, you know, returned to us from a local machine shop or a supplier, I thought, hey, you know, we like to move pretty fast here when we're testing things out. Um, you know, can I get this made potentially today and run it? And so I think it's a perfect opportunity to uh, get this made. Um, I need two parts made, one for each side. And I'm going to do that on our uh, MR1 CNC gantry mill. And I also wanted to kind of take the opportunity to walk through, you know, all the steps that it takes to take a piece of material and machine it into this. So we'll start at the very beginning and hopefully by the end of this, we'll have a working part that I can um, go out to the machine, out to one of the Crossfire XRs that we have and um, show you that thing running. So uh, let's get into it. All right, so the next step in making these brackets on our CNC mill is we need to have the raw material prepared. So in order to do that, uh, I'm going to cut some blanks on our vertical horizontal uh, bandsaw. You guys may recognize this unit. This is a Harbor Freight piece of equipment. Um, we've had this for a number of years and honestly, no complaints. Um, if you understand its limitations and you put good blades on it, um, I think it's going to work out pretty good for you if you guys are looking for sort of the, the low end um, budget unit to, to prepare material like this. Um, 
you know, the one modification that we actually have made um, is we had the coolant uh, pump actually went out on this thing. Um, and fortunately, you know, we make uh, the coolant tanks as well as the pumps and the lock lines um, for the MR1 CNC milling machine. Um, and so we just swap those over here. That's what you see running here. It's uh, worked out pretty good for us. So the first step, um, we've got our material loaded into the bandsaw here. So you'll notice that this is a piece of round material. Um, I know what you're thinking. It's not ideal when you're trying to make a rectangular part. A lot of times when you're doing these projects, you know, you just have to use the material you have on hand. And fortunately, we have a ton of this um, 6061 aluminum. It's a uh, four and just shy of four and a quarter inches in diameter round. Um, we had it for another project that didn't end up working out. So a lot of the times we need, um, you know, prototypes and things like that made around the shop. Uh, it's kind of a go-to as long as we can fit. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is, um, we know that the bracket is a half inch thick. Um, I wanna have enough stock that on the mill, I can clean up on the, on the front and the back side of the faces and have enough stock to get those nice and clean. And also this bandsaw, um, you know, it's not um, super rigid, not a very industrial machine. It does have a tendency to cut on a little bit of an angle, um, especially in thicker material like this. And so I just wanna make sure that when I do, you know, go clean up the back side on this thing, I have plenty of material. So, I think we're gonna shoot for about three quarters of an inch. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get that measured here. Um, I'm gonna cut two of these out, and then uh, the next step, we'll be taking it out to the mill and getting it ready to machine. All right, so it looks like this finished. Um, you know, pretty happy with this cut, looks good. All we gotta do is just cut another and we'll be in business. Okay, so now that we have our material blanks prepared, it's time to mount them in the machine and start making some cuts. So as I mentioned before, this is the MR1 CNC gantry mill. This is our newest product. If you want to learn more about this machine and what it can do, I invite you to go on our website where we've got pictures, videos, spec tables, FAQs, really just a ton of information if you want to take a deep dive on what this machine is capable of. You'll notice I've got a couple options um, that I'm running on this machine here. I've got the enclosure. I have the coolant system, which includes the coolant tank, the pump, as well as the coolant nozzle on the mounting brackets for that. Um, I've got the touch screen and controller computer and the mounting arm. Um, and then inside the machine, I have two 10 inch um, low profile modular vices. We actually make these vices custom for this machine. Um, I've got a tool setter here, which um, this tool or this machine does not come with a auto tool changer, so having a tool setter like this makes um, making manual tool changes very fast. Um, let's see, I've also got a touch probe that we'll be using a little bit later in this video. Um, this actually moves and touches the material. It's got a really accurate stylus tip on here, um, and we'll use that to basically set the origin of our material. And lastly, I have a wireless jog pendant. Um, just makes it really easy to move the machine around and use some other keyboard shortcuts, especially when you're in here close to the material. So just um, one caveat I'd like to mention, you know, as we start getting into this machine, this, this unit right here um, has been uh, our workhorse for the last year. Um, so you'll notice it is not pristine by any means. Um, we have over 600 hours of spindle on time on this machine. And really our sole intent um, when we built this unit was how can we push this machine to its limits and really kind of test um, what it can do and, and frankly try to break it so we can understand its limitations and, and fix things along the way. So it's been a great machine for us. Um, we've done countless prototypes. We've done production runs um, for parts on our, our CNC plasma table lines. We've done you know, countless rework. Um, it really has been a great machine for us. So with that said, let's get the material in here and we'll start making some cuts. All right, so as I mentioned before, you know, this is a round piece of stock and this vise obviously isn't great for kind of holding under round parts. You can see here, if I were to tighten the vise here, you know, I've just got a little bit of clamping surface here, which make me, you know, a little bit nervous. Um, you know, a workaround for that is if you had um, maybe a V block of sorts that you can put on both sides to really clamp, or you could take um, almost like a, a chuck, like a three jaw chuck and mount it to the base plate. You know, that'd be ideal for holding onto rounds. Um, what I'm going to do, which makes it really easy here, is I'm going to put this in the vise and using the end mill that we're going to use in our first um, operation, which is a half inch two flute carbide end mill. Um, 
I'm basically going to machine just two tracks, one here and then one on the opposite side here. And that'll give me a nice ledge on both sides that if I flip this over, I can then mount it into the vise here and hold on tight. Um, the one thing I am going to do here, though, is I kind of mentioned before that the bandsaw has a tendency to cut at an angle. And, you know, just looking at this, it's maybe off by an eighth inch or so. So to give us the most success here and make sure we have all the stock we need to clean up, I have a one, two, three block in here. And what I'm going to do is set that down on the bottom surface of this vise like that, make sure all the chips are clean. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this surface here, which I, you know, I guess this one would be better, which I know to be pretty flat. I'm going to set it down on top of here. That way, when I go ahead and tighten this up here and I machine these tracks and I flip it over, the track surfaces that are sitting down on this vise jaw are going, it's going to make it so this face that I want to start machining into is, you know, relatively flat so that I can, I can uh, remove basically minimal material and start getting right into our stock. Um, one thing I need to be wary of here is I don't want to go too deep um, into these tracks um, because then I'll have issues when I go and flip the part over. Um, so I'm really just going to take just a, maybe an eighth inch down um, just to kind of make things easy here. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this vise down here and then we'll just kind of you know in manual mode jog around with the spindle on and we'll just uh go ahead and start making some chips here yeah you want to make sure you get this vise nice and tight especially you know we're not holding on to a whole lot here um all right Okay, so I've got the spindle spinning. Um, we're going at about uh, 8,000 RPM right here, um, which carbide and aluminum, that's really the ideal surface uh, feed and bin it for this half inch end mill. Um, I'll get into kind of the particulars of how we're gonna go do the actual cut on this once we, once we start making our programs. But for now, um, I'm literally just going to go down, um, you know, an eighth of an inch here. And, you know, we don't need to go too crazy here. Um, start making some chips. All right, so that's pretty good for that side. I'll come over here. You know, um, the best machining direction is really climb milling. Um, but, you know, for something like this, we're just going to go ahead and... You know, this, this mill is rigid with a good spindle. It pretty much likes anything at this speed, so. All right, that's pretty much the idea there. All right, so now that we have our spindle off, um, you know, we've got a nice smooth edge here on both sides. I'm just gonna kind of clear the chips out of the way here. And next step is going to be to doing the same thing on our other block. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and get this flipped and into our first setup. All right, so now that our material is nice and tight in this vise, the next thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is install what's called a part stop. Um, and I'm gonna install that into our base plate here. And I think the best place to do that is have it kind of rest against this edge here. Um, the reason a part stop is important is if I'm going to go make a bunch of these, um, which I know I'm only making two, but you know, let's say I was you know, making significantly more than that, um, we don't have an auto tool changer on this machine. Meaning, you know, if we're going to go through three or four tool changes, we're going to want to do the first operation using this tool and pass all the parts through onto that tool. Then we can load the new tool in and then go ahead and basically run through all the parts through on that next tool, so on and so forth. It just makes for a much more streamlined um, approach when you don't have a tool changer. Um, so let's go ahead and get that installed here. So as I started setting up this part stop, I initially was going to do it over here, but then I had remembered I couldn't really butt something up against this, you know, to be tangent up against this block here because our end mill is going to be coming in here and cutting, which means that we need to basically have whatever part stop needs to be touching the part, um, but at a point below where the end mill is going to run. So I know, of course, I'm not going to be running my end mill into my vise itself. Um, then I had the idea of, well, I've got another vise here. Um, you know, it'd be real easy just to stick a bar in here and basically do the same thing. But on this side, um, you can see that this edge, it's a really nice machined edge on this, this piece of uh, stainless here. Um, and I'm able to get this edge to sit below this vice jaw. So I'll have plenty of clearance when the end mill is coming around here. 
And then when I swap in a new part, I can just slide it in and have it just butt up right against this edge here and then press go on the, on the uh, operation. It's just gonna go cut it. And that way when we put it back in and we can do subsequent operations, everything's gonna be nice and lined up. So now that we have our material loaded into the machine, it's time to write all of our cutting programs. We'll do that using the CAM software on the computer. All right, so now that we are in our software here, we can start writing some of the um, programs for how this is going to cut. Now, just a caveat here, I am using Autodesk Inventor Professional. This is um, Autodesk sort of enterprise version of CAD CAM software. Um, I'm sure a lot of you, if you've made it this far, you're probably familiar with Autodesk Fusion, which is um, a great piece of software. It's made by the same guys at Autodesk, um, but it's, it's much more affordable, um, you know, more for the kind of tailored towards the hobbyist, small business side. Um, I'll just kind of pull up their website here. I, I, I invite you to check them out. They do, you know, three axis milling manufacturing. So you can design parts, you can, you can do the tool pathing, which is called CAM. Um, really a great piece of software and really a lot of the things that I'm going to be doing here um, are pretty much identical in Fusion. It's just I'm most comfortable with this and it's going to be easy to kind of go through this. Um, but, you know, really all CAM softwares um, are, you know, pretty much follow the same basic concepts is what I'm going to go through here. So normally when I sit down and I and I try and program a part for milling, um, I'd like to basically do all of my programs in one go. I kind of get a mental idea of what tools I'm going to use and the, the setups and kind of the order of operations and then I write the programs and I go execute on that. Um, I think for this video just it'll be easiest if before each cut I make I'll come back to the computer here and we'll go through exactly what's happening and how I program it and what tool we're using and feeds and speeds and then we'll go out to the machine and we'll make that cut. So first off, what we need to do is we need to we need to um, create a setup. Now, what a setup is is the when we put a cutting tool um, into this program, it basically needs to know what material am I starting with? In this case, a round puck, and also where the heck does the tool go in relation to the part inside of it, right? Um, so that's where that's where the setup comes in. So if I click the setup button here. Um, I'm going to basically create a new milling setup. Um, and we know um, I'm going to select a fixed size cylinder because we know that's what we're working with here. Um, I took the liberty to measure this diameter with calipers here so I know exactly what, what diameter we have. And then I also took the thickness of the puck after it came out of the bandsaw and measured that as well. Um, the thickness isn't super important. Um, we're going to bias the, um, the part to the top of here so that anything left on the back side, we're just going to machine away. So what we'll do is let's go ahead and enter some of those values. So we'll do a fixed size cylinder. I measured this at about 4.215. Um, doesn't need to be perfect. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where the part is sitting in there now. As terms of the length, um, I measured close to... I believe it was about 0.850, so let's just go ahead and throw that in here. Again, that's not super important, but what is important is the relationship of this part inside for my first setup. So if you remember out at the vise, I wanted, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of make it so that the, the tracks that I machined into this puck, so it's sitting in the vise, was flat. That's why I put that one, two, three block in when I flipped it over. So I'm going to offset it from the top here and you know, we can go kind of generous here, you know, something like a 50 thousandths cleanup off the top. I, I, I do think that will all clean up. Um, and I guess we'll find out here soon. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then really the last thing to do is where's my origin, right? You can see this, um, I've got a work coordinate system showing the X direction, the Y, and then the Z. Um, and CNC milling, Z positive is always up. So that's why that arrow is going there. So if I was looking, you know, how this would be oriented into my vice right now, it would be right here. I've got X traveling left to right. I've got Y going in and out away from me. And then I have Z, of course, going up. And this setup is selected right at that center point. I could change that, but obviously that works good for us. Um, we just need to remember that our origin here is the top of the stock. 
So when I go and I mill away, right, on this, on this first operation, we're gonna take this down so that we actually reveal that face in there. But for subsequent tools, I need to remember that my Z0 is really the top of where the stock used to be. And so we'll get into that for the first tool change. Um, it's, it's really not complicated. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and select that. So I've got my first setup here. All right, so now that I have this um, stock selected here, um, the next step really is going to be to do the first operation. So I have my operations up here. Um, and what I'm gonna be doing for this, what I really like is a feature called adaptive. Um, what adaptive does is it's going to kind of basically take the guesswork out of doing the majority of the roughing. So if I come over here and it shows the machine boundary, you know, that's obviously the perimeter of that puck. And anything within this boundary down to the depth that I tell it to go machine, it's going to go figure out a tool path to cut that out as long as it can. So what we're going to do is let's just go ahead and right off the bat set our heights here. So we know that this part goes down, um, the part is a half inch thick, and you'll see right here, it's recognizing that the bottom um, is negative 0.55. Now you're probably wondering, why is that not a half inch? Well, it goes back to what we set the stock to. If you remember the stock, we had a um, film on top um, where it was showing, I'm actually gonna go back out so you can see here. Um, you know, I had buy, I'd push the part down 50,000. So that's what that 50,000 is. So really the bottom surface here is negative 0.55 inches down from the top. So let's go ahead and get back into adaptive and, um, let's see. So we're going to keep that. That looks good. We want to machine all the way down to the model bottom. That's exactly where we want to be. Um, and in terms of stock to leave, what that means is I want to, I want to leave a finishing pass, um, at least on the perimeter edges around here and on the inside of this bore here. And the reason that it's important is when I go and hog this away fast, um, I'm going to be, you know, really pushing the tool and, you know, it's, it's the adaptive tool path leaves somewhat rough edges on the outside as the tool kind of pushes in and you'll kind of see that after we go and do that. And so what a finish pass is, is it allows me to come in real nice and slow with that tool at the actual size of the part and clean it up. So I like to, as a general rule of thumb, I like to do about 3% of the tool diameter um, in terms of radial um, um, stock to leave. So, you know, if I take 3% of that, I'm left with 15 thousandths. So let's go ahead and leave that 15 thousandths. And in terms of axial stock, I really don't have a reason to leave any here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and fix, you know, rough at the final depth and then because we're going to machine that off and that'll make sense later as we get to that. So then what we're going to do is we need to select our tool, right? This, the machine needs to know when it creates a tool path what we're actually using to make the cut. So um, we, as I showed you guys before, I'm using a flat uh, mill, otherwise known as an end mill. Um, and it is a half inch diameter and um, it's two flutes um, and you know what I, I'm not I'm not setting any of the flutes or anything like that in the actual tool um, I know on this machine that I can spin this um, I can spin this cutter at 8,000 rpm and I'm and I'm you know still under the maximum surface feed a minute in aluminum so I think for this video we're just really gonna hog um, you know, you can kind of go watch some of our other videos on YouTube where we just kind of showcase some cutting footage. I figure, you know, when we're making this rough and cut, why not? Let's just go for it. The spindle is extremely powerful on this machine. It's very rigid. Um, I know it will definitely do this cut. And more than anything, I think it's impressive just to show you that. So we'll, we'll set some modest lead-ins at 85 inches a minute. We're going to do our cutting feed rate at 100 inches a minute, which is the max um uh, movement speed of this machine it's also the rapid speed so we're going to be really you know going to town on that um for the ramp what the ramp is um i'll kind of describe that later on the next menu but to get down into this bore i need to plunge the tool directly into the material and what it's going to do is it's going to do a helical spiral down almost like a drilling motion but we're going to get down to our cutting depth and then it's going to start um, getting into its adaptive tool path as it makes its way out of this bore. So I like to kind of, you know, again, this machine, you can really push it in aluminum. Um, we don't need to go too crazy here. I think, you know, we can say something like 50 inches a minute. 
Um, and plunge feed rate, we're not really doing any direct plunging on this setup. That'll come in later when we do our when we do our contour finishing. But for now, we can leave that. Um, I mentioned that helical ramp. Generally, I just leave this exactly as is. Um, you know, I, I set a two degree ramp, which isn't too aggressive. Um, sometimes I'll set this clearance height to like fifty thousands above the material. Um, and that way, you know, it doesn't start its helical move way up here, right? Um, there's really no reason for that if, if you feel confident about your program. Um, and the helical ramp diameter usually defaults to something a little bit under the tool size. I used to, I like to go as big of a diameter as you can. It really allows for the most kind of chip clearing as it's making its way in. Um, and so now what we need to determine is Really, to define a cut, you need three things in order to understand if it's really going to work on this machine. You need your feed rate, I need my cut depth, and I need my amount of radial cut in, or my width of cut. Now, I told you that, you know, I think I'm going to try and push this machine. I know I, I can get, you know, if, if you really wanted to overload the spindle for a short burst, you can get 10 MRR on this machine in aluminum with a half inch end mill. I'm going to do something a lot more, what I think is sort of, on the limit for functional machining is around 5 MRR. And what MRR means is the material removal rate. And that's, an, that's expressed in cubic inches um, per minute. And that is how many cubic inches of material is this thing removing per minute. So a really simple way to do that is you multiply your feed rate times your depth of cut times your width of cut. So I know I want to be at 5. And I know, so I'm going to divide through and see what our width of cut should be. I know we want to be at 5 MRR. I know I'm going at 100 inches a minute. And I know that I want to basically machine this whole thing all in one shot. Um, so I want the tool all the way down to that um, half inch. So what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to divide this by um, the full half inch depth of cut. That leaves me with 0.1 inch of uh, basically step over. So we'll go into here and I will um, we'll basically define that here, which is known as optimal load. It is, you know, how much is it going to engage the tool on the side? Um, and you can kind of look at the graphics and tutorials. It'll, it'll kind of explain that. But um, I want to be cutting in the climb direction. Climbing is going to, um, it, it's going to give the best finishes and, and also be the, the uh, use less horsepower for the same material removal. Um, and in general, it's just easier on the tool and it also improves your tool life. Um, and like I said, the max um, roughing step down we want is a half inch. So we're gonna set that there and we should just let this um, generate a tool path. And if we need to make any changes, we can. So it looks like it just generated and that's what we'll be cutting. Okay, so I can look at this and I immediately know just from looking at this, there's already some things I want to change. Um, this is good. You know, the cam is really an iterative process. You, you know, once you understand it more, you, you know, you can recognize things and do things you want it to do, but it takes time to get there. So for one, um, I wanted to finish this all, all in one depth. And if you were following along and caught what I did, um, you know, I put our maximum roughing step down at 0.5. As you know, we need to get all the way down to 0.55. So that I need to change that. Another thing too, that now that I'm looking at this, I want to put it, I want to have a good surface finish on this face. So I think what we're going to do is go back in here and I am going to leave, um, I'm, I am going to leave some stock. So if I have stock, axial stock to leave, that's on the bottom of the tool. Meaning it'll leave, you know, if I say 10 thousandths here, It'll leave ten thousandths on this face, and it'll also leave ten thousandths as it goes to do its its um, step downs all the way down here. Um, you know, so the easiest way we can do that is on the next setup when we clean up our contours. We'll we'll address that when we get there. So we'll just go ahead and leave that ten thousandths axial stock, um, which means that you know as we do our big roughing step down, we need to get all the way down to at least 0.54 inches. That's the five five minus the ten to leave, which means I need to kind of calculate our five MRR again, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. So five divided by hundred inches a minute divided by going all the way down to 0.54 divided by um, no, I guess that's it. So we need to be 92 and a half. So optimal load, I'll put 92 thousandths. And we're just going to go ahead and leave that. Um, and so this should finish all in one setup now.
and it does it gets it gets all the way down to where i want you can see that's the stock that i left that's fine we'll clean that up in the next operation so yeah this this looks pretty good i've got my you know facing operation um which it's just kind of roughed in and then we're going to go rough part so you know why don't we simulate this so we can actually see what's going to happen um i like to you know show the uh the tool and the tool holder is transparent and you know i can that way i can show the stock here and i'm kind of visualizing what's going to happen so why don't we speed this up um you know so we're going to go all the way down to the part and you know if we wanted to go see you know how far are we down here we're well in z we're down negative 539 okay close to 540 like we wanted um let's just keep going through here so it's just going to kind of you know pack around that outside then we're doing that bore um and we're leaving that that 15 thou and then we're cleaning that up and we should be down 40 here and we are negative um, zero three nine thousands which okay again makes sense all right so that feels pretty good for um for our just kind of rough adaptive um facing here so um the next thing to do is um we're gonna, you know, everything I'm gonna do in this one setup with this tool, I'm gonna write it all into this program. So we're gonna clean up the, um, we'll do the sidewall finishes and then we'll also do the facing. So I'll make two operations for that and we'll just do that right now. So the next thing we're gonna wanna do is why don't we face this off? Um, we're gonna be using the same tool. Um, for this, you know, we want, a, we want a nice finish on here. So we can go something a little slower, you know, something like 35 inches a minute. It'll leave a pretty good face. I usually like to lead in, lead out a little slower. I don't need to ramp or plunge here since it's just facing. And um, my top height, again, is stock top because I'm in the same setup. Um, and my bottom height is going to be the model top because I left 10 thousandths. So it'll just go clean that up. Um, step over that's basically using the full width of the tool um, minus 15 so that's good and pass extension and you know stock offset sometimes I like to go you know just just to be safe I'll, I'll go around the boundaries excess of like 0.15 L so let's just see what this looks like um, that looks pretty good you know this may just be me being a stickler but I think you know I'd rather have my facing passes go along the long axis I just think visually it looks better so I'm going to go back into here and pass direction. I'm just going to rotate that 90 degrees and that should give me what I'm looking for. And it does. So if we simulate this um, again, this stock is already gone. So to ignore that because we machined all that away, but we should be at negative 50 and we are. So this is just going to be a nice finish pass here. Um, and that's looking pretty good. But I'm happy with that. All right, 35 inches a minute, everything looks good. All right, and then really the final thing to do is just to clean up these, these edges here. Uh, and so in order to do that, we're going to do a 2D contour, and I'm gonna select this contour as well as that contour. And um, you know, I, this is also a finishing move too. I want these sidewalls to look nice. So uh, you know, I'm even gonna go you know, potentially slower than that. I, I'm not trying to win any races here. I just want to have, you know, a nice sidewall finish that I know this machine is capable of getting. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, selected contour should be the bottom. I should go all the way down to that negative 550. And um, everything else looks good here. And in terms of my entry, I'm just basically making a direct plunge move down um, to finish height. So, you know, maybe just, just to be safe, we'll go real slow there um all right let's see what this looks like so i should plunge down and then i'm just going to go nice and slow around and again i should be at that negative five five finish and i am and we're making a nice 25 inches a minute and that's it so what i can do is i can actually combine all these programs together so that if i were to simulate this it is going to basically go and run through all this and simulate you know i did my roughing now i'm doing my facing and now I'm going to go in and do my finishing here. So you'll notice on this finishing pass, um, it does go down into this stock out here, 10 thousandths. I don't care because I'm going to clean all that up anyway, and it's going to leave my geometry exactly you know, fixed to where I want it. 
So that looks good, and all I need to do now is hit post process, and I can create this program. So actually, one last thing that we could check real quick, just out of curiosity, is if we go to simulate with all of them selected, let's look at statistics. It says that this program machining time looks like about four minutes and fifty-five seconds. Um, that's pretty impressive. Um, so let's uh, you know as we machine in, we'll see how that compares, and now I can um, basically export this program, and let's go cut it on the machine. Okay, so now that we're back out at the machine, um, you'll notice I have our touch probe loaded into the spindle here. Um, what, what we're going to use this for is cut control has um, some can cycles that you can run with this probe that um, can find uh, the center of things, the edges, um, you know, it can find the center of an inside bore. In this case, the can cycle I'm going to be using is finding the center of a boss. So, you know, this is sticking up. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to go and touch off various points here, and then it's going to basically calculate the arc and then set the origin position in the center. If you remember what we were doing in the computer, our origin is exactly in the center here um, at the top of the material. So the probe is also going to be touching down onto this material and, and setting our Z0 plane to this top of the stock. And then after it does that, um, the probe is going to come over here and touch our tool setter. And the reason it's going to do that is it's basically going to calculate the height of this tool setter plat in here um, and the, the difference in height between this and the surface of our stock. And it's basically going to store that delta value in the software. Um, and the reason that, that that's important is that when we go and make a tool change, um, all we have to do is load the tool in the, in the uh, collet and press a button and it's going to come over here and touch down and then automatically set the Z value of that tool. So it makes doing tool changes very fast. Um, so the first thing is first here, let's go ahead and home the machine. Just It's always good practice whenever you um, start on a project like this just to make sure. So there's two limit switches in the back uh, of the gantry mill. It actually auto squares the gantry in, in case there's some type of out of rack, but in this case, um, you know, no issues there. So once we uh, once we're nice and homed, um, what I'm going to do is uh, the can cycle that you put in cut control here. You, you basically start uh, at the center of the boss and you tell it the diameter, which I've already done. So you know, as long as I get roughly in the center here. Um, I should be um, good to go ahead and start this program, so we're going to start probing now. Okay, so it looks like it completed here. You'll see that it did a rapid move back to our origin. Um, and just looking at that, you know, it looks like we are dead center in the center of this. So now the last thing we have to do is we're going to go do that, that uh, tool setter move here. So it, um, the software knows where this tool setter is, the center of it. It's a uh, setting that you can put in, and whenever you move this tool setter, um, you know, it'll always you can go find its place whenever you put that in. Okay, so now that we have our delta value stored, um, next thing to do is we're gonna pop our first tool in there, and then uh, we should be good to start running this program. Okay, so now that we have our first tool loaded in, um, it's now time to touch our tool setter. And so what will happen is this is gonna go make a move over to here and then come down and, and set its height off of here. Um, and then what the software will do is it knows the delta, again, like I said, from this surface to the top of our material here. So it's gonna go ahead and do that move and then automatically set the Z0 of this tool to our stock top. So we'll go ahead and run this now.
All right, so now that we have our Z set, um, what I like to do is, you know, just to kind of a little peace of mind here, what we can do is we'll get kind of close to the material and I know it's kind of hard for you guys to see from the, the camera angle here, but I will basically jog up to um, Z0 and then visually we'll just see, you know, does it look like it matches? So let's come down here. All right, that's Z0 and if we kind of look, you know, how um, you know, that looks like it's spot on there. Okay, so now the next thing to do is, um, it's time to run this program.
Okay, so looks like the first operation is complete. Um, you know, that looked pretty good. Uh, although I will say, I think we have a pretty big opportunity here to really reduce our cycle time. There were a lot of um, retract moves um, that I think were, you know, pretty unnecessary. So I've gone and created a new program that I'm gonna run here for the um, second blank. Um, the first program, the software calculated a cycle time of four minutes and 55 seconds. Um, you know, not bad for a part of this size, but um, I went ahead and basically got rid of all those unnecessary rapid retract moves by uh, making sure that the tool stays down in the cut. Um, and I was able to reduce the cycle time actually by 30% down to uh, three minutes and 25 seconds. So that's about a whole minute and a half savings there on this first tool. And, you know, like I said, CAM really is an iterative process, especially if you're going to be going into some level of, you know, production run um, where, where seconds matter. Um, so definitely can be improved on. So um, let's go ahead and watch this. All right, so now that our first operation is complete, we're back at the computer and we're going to write our programs for the second and third operations. So to refresh your memory, the second operation is going to be to drill these holes here for the 1024 tapped holes. And the third operation will be, we're going to use a chamfer tool and we will chamfer these outside contours to make the part look really nice. So a little bit on these threads. Um, you know, the MR1 machine is fantastic at thread milling. Um, that is where you take a tool that has the sort of thread profile and we can come down into this thread and spiral around as we move and we actually cut physically the threads. Um, it's a great process. It's actually very fast, um, especially if you don't have rigid tapping on your machine like MR1. Unfortunately, I don't have a 1024 um, thread mill or at least one that is small enough to get in there. Um, but I do have uh, one that will work on quarter 20 threads, which are these ones here. So all is not lost. When we get to this operation here, you will see the thread mill working. Um, but for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drill the holes. And then what we'll do is we'll hand tap those. So let's go ahead and write the program um, to come in and drill these holes. So First things first, I'm going to pull up a tap and drill size chart. Um, just quick Google search will, we'll, um, you know, these are pretty readily available. So 
we're using a 1024 thread and that means the drill hole that I need to make here is um, a number 25 drill or 0.1495. Um, so I've got an index drill set, so I'm good to go here. Um, now I'm just gonna basically write the program for this and show you guys how to do that. So our setup hasn't changed, we're still here. Um, you know, we have that part stop holding us right here, maintaining our X position, and then um, our Y position still is that back vice jaw that's, um, you know, holding it to the center here. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and come up here and we're gonna select drill. Um, in terms of spindle RPM, um, you know, you have, um, you, gotta, you gotta think about what your surface feet per minute are. A smaller diameter drill, you can spin faster. Um, and this is a pretty small diameter. So I'm just gonna come in here and just create a quick drill. Um, I don't know if they're gonna have the size I need in here. Let's take a look. Um, let's see, number 25. You know, just to make things quick here, I'm just gonna select um, a size here and then I'm going to edit the tool. Just make it the exact diameter we need. Um, which again, this is, you know, call it 150, and it's a standard twist drill with a 118 degree tip. Um, so we're gonna do that, and I'm gonna just select that drill. All right, obviously that's way longer than the drill is, but really what matters is, um, you know, the center of these holes where it's gonna go find that. So I'm gonna select the geometry, which are these four holes, and um, in terms of spindle speed, um, you know, we don't, Need to do anything crazy here. I'll probably just spin this at about 4,000 RPM. Um, that's pretty low, you know, it's a pretty decent surface uh, foot a minute in uh, high speed steel. Um, or, or, sorry, the, the drill is a high speed steel drill bit in aluminum, so that's, that's pretty good. And in terms of plunge, um, I'll probably just do a direct plunge down. Um, there's really no need to do any pecking or anything. Um, and I'm not, you know, I don't need to go too crazy here. So we'll go 15 inches a minute. Um, and in terms of our heights, um, you know, we don't need, since we already face some stock off the top, um, you know, we can actually just start at the whole top, which will bring the drill down to here, right? If we still had stock left, I'd be a little bit worried about that, but we're going to start right here. And in terms of uh, the whole bottom, you know, I, I want to, you know, if we were just to go to the whole bottom, obviously I'm not cleaning that all the way up. So you know, since I'm over air in this vise, I can go all the way down, you know, another 0.2 inches, um, and that should, that should work fine. Um, I'm just gonna do drill, wrap it out. Um, if I wanted to, you know, if I were doing sort of a larger hole here and I wanted to move fast, I would do some trip chip clearing, which is sort of a peck operation. But for right now, I'm good with this. Um, and so I'm just gonna create this program. And if we simulate it, um, to be pretty straightforward we're just going and drilling and so this is about 45 seconds so not bad um all right now let's go ahead and write our um our chamfer program so i'm going to use the 2d contour tool for this i'm going to select the um, two contours that i want to clean up and then i'm going to come over to my tool and we're going to select a would be a chamfer mill and i know that i have a quarter inch um 45 degree chamfer um which that's that's the tip there and so the total angle is 90 degrees um inventor is calling this a 45 degree chamfer you'll really see it both ways um so i'm going to go ahead and select this tool um we'll spin this at 8,000 rpm um you know chamfering is a finish operation so i am going to go slow here so we can get a nice finish um you know kind of feed into the part nice and easy and okay that looks pretty good um and then for our heights um let's see i don't need to start at the stock top um you know our our top height really could be if we wanted to model top to kind of go quicker here which i'll do um and then when i have a chamfer mill selected as a tool um the the software automatically will detect that it is a chamfer so what i want to do is i'm going to make this a 20 thou chamfer um i just think that'll look pretty clean it's, it'll break the edges up nicely and in terms of the uh the tip offset what this does is instead of you know cutting down at the at right at the tip of the tool i can offset um you know how deep the uh the, the tool goes in and you'll see that on simulation but i'm just going to bump it down 20 thousands 
So I think this should look pretty good here. Um, let's go ahead and simulate it. So let's pretty looks pretty clean. Um, what I'll do is I'll just pause it here and you can see what I was meaning by that tip offset. So you'll see that this this tip is offset 20 thousandths down. Um, this is kind of nice too, you know, as if you if you sense that your chamfer um, tool is wearing, you can offset it down to start cutting at sort of different depths on the tool. But this looks pretty good to me. So um, and we'll just kind of see what the total time here minute. OK, not not surprising for a finish operation. So um, I think we're ready to go ahead and um, cut these programs out at the machine. Okay, so now that we are done with all three operations in our first setup, it's time to flip the part and get into our second and last setup. So just taking a look at this, um, really happy with it so far. All the surface finishes look good. Everything looks like it, it uh, came out exactly as we wanted. So now what we need to do is, you know, you can kind of see the part that we want to end up with, which is this. Um, we want all this stuff off of the back of it. And we want a nice clean face on that side. And we also want to throw this chamfer around that as well. So what I'm going to do here is, you know, I've got these nice um, parallel surfaces here that I can hold within the vise. And I might as well just keep my part stop in here um, because I've got basically a 90 degree between here and here. So if I treat this as my um, Y axis zero and then this as my X axis zero, that puts my origin basically right here. So that's when I go to make these programs, I want this to be my origin. Um, and what I'm going to do for my Z origin is a little bit different. Um, I have this one, two, three block sitting in here. And what I want to do there is I want this surface to be resting against this one, two, three block like this so that I can put this in here and I could butt the, this to the device and then this side here to here. And then there's my X, Y, and Z zeros. And if I just push that in there, and that's kind of our setup there. Um, so that way the tool, what we're going to do is we're just going to come and we're going to face off at a known depth relative to this surface here, right? So if we call this Z zero, then our facing operation, you know, this is a half inch thick. So our facing operation is going to be coming in at, you know, um, basically positive Z 0.5 and we'll come and do all that facing. Um, so it just kind of makes it easy when you're doing setups like this to kind of think about you know where your origin positions are and then how you want to fixture them you know if i was just doing a one-off I, I could just put you know parallels in here and set this in here but since i am doing you know at least two of these it makes it easier to have a nice setup that i can just load these blanks into so what i'm going to do is i'll get the probe and i'm going to probe that surface there i'm going to probe here and i'm going to probe here and then those will set my cord my work coordinate zeros and then Pretty much it's time to um, run the programs once we get those created. Okay, so now that I have the probe in here, I can start touching off some of these surfaces to set the origin position for our work coordinate offset. This is for our second setup. Again, this is going to be our Z0 surface. This will be our X0 surface, the end of the part stop, and then the back jaw of the vise will be our Y0. So I'm gonna be running um, the single axis can cycle probing within cut control. Um, so right now what I'm going to do is set it up to do our Z move here, and here we go.
All right, so that just set our z zero. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and do the same for x and y here. So I will go ahead and load this for our x. Okay, now we can do the same for y. Okay, so now that those are completed, um, our origin position is going to be right in this corner here. So we can go ahead and put our first tool in here and then we'll go back to the computer and write our programs. Okay, so now that we're back at the computer, we can go ahead and write our final programs for our second setup. So again, if you'll recall, the first thing we need to do is create this new setup. I'll go into this menu here. Now, this second setup, I'll admit, is a little bit trickier than the first. Um, we've basically got our part sitting in here, flipped upside down, and then above that, we still have that circular puck. So we kind of still need to reflect that when we go and create the setup. So I have the part oriented just like this in the vise. Um, we've got this surface here against the back jaw of the vise. That's that's our y zero, and then this is our x zero against the part stop, and then. If you remember, Z0 is actually the bottom here, sitting on that one, two, three block. So the first thing we need to do is set our work coordinate origin. And I'm actually gonna do that off of the model box point. So that's gonna go snap these points that constrict to the model. So if you think about it, we're at that point there. And this is not pointing in the right direction. So if I click this bottom here and I can align it to the X axis and then we'll flip it. So that looks good. Um, we basically, we have X here, we got Y running that way, and then Z coming up, and it's at the bottom. So that looks good for our origin. Then the next thing we need to do is we need to set our stock. So what I did was I went and I measured the puck. I wanted to see how much stock thickness there was, and on average there was about 0 0.350 inches. So we'll go ahead and do a fixed size cylinder, and we'll, if you remember, we'll call this 4.215. And the length is about 350, and then we'll offset that from the front by 0.35. So looking at this, this should basically represent exactly what we have. We've got what's sticking out on the bottom, and then we've got the remaining puck there, and then we have our origin position, you know, on the on the bottom piece here, corresponding to the model, since that's finished machine. So this looks good. Um, now what we can do is we're going to write our final operations to basically clear this off and then we'll face the backside. So we'll go into the facing menu here. We're going to um, select our half inch tool. This is the same tool that we roughed the first side at. And again, we'll set this to 8,000 RPM. Um, and we'll come back to the cutting feed rate because I think what I want to do here is um, we roughed the first side out. We kind of did more of a high speed machining tool path, but we were doing five MRR for our material removal rate. But we were going the full depth and then we were taking our shallow width of cut going fast at 100 inches a minute. So I think for this, we'll mix it up a little bit just to show you the versatility of this machine. And we'll actually basically go low and slow here. We'll go full um, that full depth but we'll go full step over too and we'll just figure out whatever um, feed rate that ends up being so if it's a half inch tool we'll use the 0.475 step over and if we pull up the calculator again um, we want that 5 MRR so we're going to divide our um, average cut depth of 350 which is the stock that we have left and we're going to divide that by the step over, which is the full step over 475. And that leaves 30 inches a minute. So let's go ahead and plug that in. And we'll just lead in at the same. Should be fine. Um, so now this is where it gets kind of tricky. We need to select our height. Um, so what we're going to do here is um, our, the top height, we're going to want to set to the stock top, that makes sense. But the bottom height, we wanna set this to um, offset from the model top, which is where we wanna be. Um, and then in, in setting this up, or at least thinking about this, I, I noticed that um, 
you know, when I went and I did this front side, I really should have went to a deeper depth. Something like, you know, this this part is supposed to be a half inch thick, and I really should have went to something like 510 on the depth, so that when I flipped it over, I would have had stock to remove the face. Um, but fortunately, you know, the thickness of this part doesn't matter. Um, so what I'm gonna do is actually, um, I'll rough to the finished depth, and then I'll take five thousandths down, or sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll rough at to a half inch, and then I'll go an additional five thousandths down for our finish. So we'll basically just rough down to our model top here, um, and we'll basically leave everything as is and see what this comes up with. Okay, so that's as expected. It's just basically going to go rough this. Um, let's see how it looks in the simulation. And that's not right. I think I had those selected. All right, here we go. Run this. So that looks like our stock, and it's going to come in here. And, and you'll notice, you know, relative to, to the first roughing we did on the other side, this is this is kind of like the full depth, low type of cut. Um, and the machine should really handle this nicely. And let's look at our height here. We have a height of a half inch. And the model is showing that the stock is there, but really that's gone. Obviously, that has no thickness to it. So this should just reveal the part under it. Um, so that looks good. And then the next thing I'm going to do is do that facing finish pass, like I was saying. But we'll just go down 5,000. Let's select this. Um, we'll do, you know, we'll go a little bit slower here. We'll get a nice, nice finish. Um, and for our cut height, we're basically going to do model top, but then let's go down that 5,000 so that we were going to take under. And everything else, I believe we could leave the same here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Um, you know, the one thing I am going to correct on this um, operation, it's kind of what I did on the first one too, I like to leave a little bit of stock offset. Um, just makes it so that, you know, Double check that you're really removing all the material that you need to be removing. And these look good, so I am ready to basically um, post this program and we'll go cut it out.
All right, I wanted to just show you guys the surface finish we were getting here. Um, very, very reflective, a lot better than the first side. And I think that has to do with the fact that we only went down five thousandths um, and finished a little slower. So definitely much better than the front side. All right, now it's time to write the rest of our programs. Um, we're basically going to finish chamfering this side and then we're going to rotate the part up and do our drilling and threading of these quarter 20 holes. So let's see, first things first, we can chamfer this side and really kind of a quick shortcut is we can just copy and paste our chamfer from the front side into this new setup here. Um, and actually what's cool is it looks like it already found um, the contours that we care about, but let's just go in here just in case. Um, you know, one thing I am going to change is I'm gonna chamfer these holes um, that way when we go to um, t uh, manually tap those holes, we don't push a burr or anything into there, into the top surface. Um, everything else looks good. Uh, the chamfer on the front side came out and they're really nice, so I'm just going to leave that. And now the next thing to do is um, our third setup, which is going to be this way. And I think the easiest way to do that is just stick this sticking up vertically in the vise have this back surface be touching against the back jaw of the vise, and then this side will be touching our part stop, and then this will be our Z0. So we'll just touch our tool right off this top surface here. So this basically is our origin, this corner. So what we'll do is we'll create a new setup, and you know our stock is basically the part geometry now, the finished part. So we'll just snap that like that, and then we'll select this corner here. Um, and looks like we have to tell it what's what. So that'll be Z going up and then flip X. So that looks right. Positive X going right, positive Y going back, positive Z coming up. So that looks good. Um, and then we're going to do the drill. Um, so back to our, our, um, our tap chart. This is a quarter 20 hole. Um, and so we need a number seven drill um, to make this hole. So let's see if I go into um, by type and we select drill. Um, should be able to find a number seven in here. Let's see. And there's a bunch of, here we go. I'll take this one and let's see if we can do five thousand here it's right in the middle between two to three hundred surface feet and we'll just do 15 inches a minute and i think for this just to show you guys i'm going to do a peck cycle here so what a peck does is it'll go down and then retract go down and retract and that's a to break up the chips just kind of helps from clogging up the flutes so we'll do a chip breaking partial retract um and you know what i'm just going to leave everything pretty much as is um and we got to select these holes and okay let's take a look at our heights now how deep do we want to go in so i know that um i need a half inch tapped hole that's the depth um and so um i'm not certain how deep these holes are in the model so what we can do is we'll just reference it from the whole top and we'll go down something like three quarters of an inch should give us plenty of um, stock to then get in with our thread mill down to that half inch um and okay this looks good create that program it's just going to come and drill those and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do our thread milling cycle so i kind of explained what this was earlier but basically you have a tool that is going to come down into here and it has the 60 degree thread profile and it's going to spiral like this around and it's going to physically cut these threads so i already have this tool created since i use it pretty often um, but it's basically this tool. I got it from McMaster Car. Um, it's just a thread mill for making a minimum of quarter inch minimum thread size. Um, and you know, if I had a smaller one, one that would have gotten down to a 1024, I absolutely would have thread milled these just because it's so fast as you'll see. So let's go ahead and write to that program. You actually use drill again. Um, the tool, like I said, I already have this tool. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, you know, you can see that that uh, looks pretty similar um to the mcmaster car one i basically just created that from the drawing we're going to spin this um at full speed 8000 rpm and just from experience i know that 15 inches a minute works pretty well for cutting those um our geometry again is going to be the um these holes here 
and our thread depth I'm going to do from the let's see whole top and we're going to go down a half inch that's how deep we want our threads to go and for the cycle we're going to select this as thread milling and um, the pitch this is a quarter 20 um, thread so that means 20 threads per inch so one inch divided by 20 gives me a pitch of 50 thousandths so we'll set this to 50 thousandths and the diameter is a 250 but I like to cut the threads just a little bit oversized um, just to have a nice um, easy fit um, and this looks pretty good um, so let's go ahead and post this program and I will simulate these two just to kind of show you guys what's going to happen here. So we're going to go down and drill it out. It's going to peck that hole. All right. And then that thread mill comes in and cuts that thread. Okay. That looks good. Let's go out to the machine and make the cuts. All right, so you can probably see why I'm a huge fan of thread milling. It's, it's honestly amazing how fast it can create these threads. Um, they came out really nice, and I've got a quarter 20 socket head cap screw that I'm just gonna check these threads on, and yeah, that just, that feels really good. That's going in nice and smooth. So, looks like this part is complete, and we can start pulling these out of the vise and get it assembled onto the machine. Okay, we are done with these parts. I'm very happy with how these turned out. They're going to bolt up to the machine nicely and should work exactly how we want them to. Um, you know, this was a fun project. Uh, for those of you that have watched this whole video, um, would have been probably a lot faster to have started with a better piece of stock, but sometimes, um, you know, you just got to work with what you have lying around the shop. Um, so you'll see that I've got it bolted up to the machine here. And, you know, all in all, not bad for um, finishing this in just under two hours certainly faster than if we would have had it sent out. All right. Well, thanks for watching.